TV. tonight. Um, so welcome to the American Writers Museum. I'd like to get everybody's attention as we have a very special guest with us tonight. Um, the American Writers Museum is where we celebrate the impact that writers have had on American history and our culture and our daily life. Now on our walls and in the exhibits here at the AWM are writers in fiction, fantasy, science, spirituality, and politics. And it's not a hyperbole to say that many of them wrote the words that changed the course of history. From Thomas Jefferson declaring independence to Ida B. Wells demanding accountability, America's writers have forever challenged the status quo and advocated fearlessly for the rights of all to be heard. AWM's surprise bookshelf series tonight features a man whose works and words have held government accountable, and his new book, The Doomsday Machine, is the latest chapter in a lifetime of confronting power, Mr. Daniel Ellsberg. Tonight, Mr. Ellsberg is in conversation with Rick Perlstein, journalist and author, who Politico called the chronicler, chronicler of the American conservative movement because of his books, Before the Storm, Nixon Land, and Under the Bridge. Please welcome tonight Daniel Ellsberg and Rick Perlstein. Thank you all. Thank you, Carrie. It's uh, truly an honor to be here at this glorious new ornament to uh, Chicago's liter literary culture and uh, America's literary culture. And it's, of course, it's, it's an honor to be here with uh, one of my heroes, uh, Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, it's an honor to have him here because when the events that he writes about in this book uh, begin, uh, when he uh, basically squirreled away thousands and thousands of pages of documents about America's nuclear command and control system uh, in tandem with releasing uh, thousands of pages of documents about the lies uh, that America uh, told in order to uh, create and sustain the Vietnam War, he expected to spend the rest of his life in jail. Mm. He knew this. And he proceeded, nonetheless, in our interests and in the world's interests. So before we do anything else, I think we should acknowledge the courage, the vision, and the sacrifices of this man, Daniel Ellsberg. He's not in jail. He's here on Michigan Avenue. <laughs> and he's writing books. Uh, the book he has written is exquisite. Uh, it's uh, extraordinarily well constructed and uh, well put together. And it takes subjects that uh, are highly technical and highly obscure, in which the powers that be rely on us believing to be highly technical and highly obscure and renders them in exquisitely crystalline prose. Uh, when I uh, embarked on the project of interviewing Dan for the latest issue of Esquire magazine, 
uh, one of the first people I turned to was an author named Fred Kaplan, who way back in the 1980s wrote a book called Wizards of Armageddon, which uh, told a portion of the story we're going to hear tonight. And I said, Fred, have you read this book? He said, yes, I have. It's, it's outstanding. Uh, and he's reviewed it in Slate magazine. And I said, what is new about this book? What does Daniel Ellsberg tell us about how the nuclear system works in America that we didn't know before? And uh, what he told me uh, was that this is really the first book that has uh, put the whole system together, explained how it works from beginning to end, uh, and that it demonstrates that the very existence of a nuclear arsenal of necessity sets in motion a logic that creates a doomsday machine. Everything about it that is worth criticizing is an inherent feature of the logic of the whole system. This is what it is. This is what it leads to. That's Fred Kaplan, uh, the, the expert on nuclear wars. Yes, and uh, to quote uh, Dan's book, he gives an absolutely astonishing account of the Cuban Missile Crisis and how that uh, came exquisitely close to ending most life on Earth. Uh, Dan estimates that there will be one or two percent left. Uh, uh, so it's not really an extinction event. He was, Dan thinks very precisely. He's an engineer. I keep on saying, well, you say this. And he's like, well, not quite. So he says it wouldn't quite bring us extinction. It would have probably brought us. Brought us so there would probably be 40 or 50 million people left. But anyway, after he narrates this, he says um, this. The existential danger to humanity of nuclear weapons does not rest solely or even mainly on the possibility of further proliferation of such weapons to quote unquote rogue or unstable nations who would handle and threaten them less quote unquote responsibly than the permanent members of the Security Council, nor does it rest merely uh, on uh, uh, the boundaries of the smaller or more recent nuclear weapon states of Israel, India, Pakistan, North Korea. What, is a true his what a true history of the Cuban Missile Crisis reveals is that the existence of masses of nuclear weapons in the hands of leaders of the superpowers, the United States and Russia, even when those leaders are about as responsible, humane, and cautious as any we have seen, pose then and still, still do intolerable dangers to the survival of civilization. I'd like to begin our discussion in the summer of 1958. You have just taken a job at our, uh, the RAND Corporation, stands for Research and Development. It's an Air Force think tank. And in a very arresting image, you talk about what happened on a certain moonless night. Well, the reason it was uh, significant that it was a moonless night was that I was reading then, I was trying to read my way in, and top secret and secret, mostly secret documents at that time it ran. Uh, and the sense of, at last, being an insider and seeing the way this thing looked from outside. So I was, I was spending really 70 hours a week, pretty much, uh, seven days a week, uh, reading, reading this stuff late at night and uh, reading into it. And hypothetical, Soviet surprise attacks uh, in great detail to which the people that ran, who I f found were as smart a group as I've ever encountered as a group of people, uh, were convinced that the Soviets, uh, on the basis of estimates from the Air Force in particular, but then national intelligence as well, were racing to produce the capability to destroy the U.S., but specifically to destroy our ability to retaliate, our deterrent capability. Uh, they had been the first to put up an ICBM, effectively, by uh, intercontinental ballistic missile. Say what? A missile that could reach us yes, from right, there. An intercontinental ballistic missile, the kind that North Vietnam is uh, striving for North at Korea. this time. Oh. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong heroic, Not the first wrong time heroic, I make. Uh, not the, you know, I still am living in that period of the <laughs> But, um, right, thank you. Um, right. And, uh, North, North Vietnam did not, uh, did not uh, acquire such capabilities. But 
North Korea is trying to get a, an ICBM, and right. we might come back to that because we there's will a very come back great, to that. a very great uh, similarity between their reasons, I think, for wanting to do that, and for Khrushchev's reasons for wanting to put medium-range missiles in range of the United States. In we're Cuba. still in 1958. So coming back to 58, <laughs> we thought they had ICBMs, and we're going toward hundreds of them at a time when we did not uh, really have any. And it wasn't thought that they had them in 58, but by 59, they might have a couple of hundred, which would be enough to uh, destroy, I've seen different figures on that, but the figure we always used at the time was 26 SAC bases. It depends on right. what you count as major, major bases. In the, uh, what was called the ZI, all these acronyms, the Zone of the Interior, uh, the uh, American continent. The homeland. Not including, I think, Alaska yeah. or, uh, or So, Hawaii But you're reading point. all this stuff and they went states. suddenly you're in existential dread. Right. So what I was reading was a report saying that they would want to coordinate their attack with the intercontinental ballistic missiles, which, by the way, were initially called intercontinental ballistic missiles, or IBMs. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a corporation objected to that, and of course, uh, they, so they became ICBMs. And uh, just as, by the way, the cent Center for International Affairs at Harvard that I was spending a lot of time at, which was run by uh, uh, Kissinger, was uh, at that point, uh, they decided to change it from CIA to Center for International Affairs, CFIA, they preferred. Okay, same idea. So the idea was, though, that they would be hitting with the ICBMs into the interior, deep into the interior in our bases, but that they would coordinate that attack with short-range or medium-range missiles, cruise missiles, from submarines on our coastal bases and on our command and control. And the submarines would be very close in and had very short flight time, so they gave essentially no warning time. Um, that phenomenon is, is still a factor in our, in our analyses on both sides. So, okay, it was going to be a coordinated attack, and they said the best time for such an attack would be in August for various weather conditions and so forth, on a moonless night, uh, about midnight, uh, coordinating this. And I looked out of my window at Rand, which was right above Muscle Beach in uh, Santa Monica, looking out at the ocean, uh, it was a moonless night, and it was about midnight. I looked at my watch, and this proverbial expression of the hairs on the back of my head, you know, rising, I remember it from that time, a chill, actually, thinking this could be the night, you know, basically, and, uh, or a, a night like this in any case. So I looked out expecting almost to see submarines out at sea. I could see them in my mind's eye because they, with cruise missiles at that time, they didn't have ballistic missiles on their submarines. Uh, the this, this subs would be on the surface. So I looked out looking, looking for subs. But that was, a, um, that was a time, also you probably saw this in the book, where the youngest members of the department, Alan Entoven and I, Alan from MIT, uh, were offered, like all RAND people, uh, actually it was the next year, TIAA CREF insurance, where, where Rand paid most of the premium, actually, more. It was very good retirement insurance. Neither of us signed up because it didn't seem there was a chance that we would pay off you know, uh, uh, on that. Uh, this, uh, most we could hope to do was to postpone this attack, to make it unpromising for the Soviets by promising retaliation if we could convince them that we would be capable, even under such an attack, for a heavy, heavy retaliation that would deter them. And we were trying to save us and save the world from a Soviet nuclear surprise attack, from war begun in that fashion. That seemed like the greatest danger in the world. And we were privileged to work long hours, obsessed with this subject of how to avert that. Right, with the highest level of devotion and the highest level of energy. Um, and, and a certain kind of trust, which you narrate over the course of the book, uh, becoming kind of a little more complicated. And what I'm thinking about is one of the reasons why it seemed credible to you that the Soviet Union might launch this uh, first strike 
against the United States and had the cap capacity to do so with us not having the capacity to retaliate in kind was that there was a very strong belief uh, in the Air Force and other intelligence services that the, there was something uh, known as a missile gap. So why don't you, why don't you explain well, I've, what I've that was and why I've it was so important? I've described that because, yeah. as I say, we, um, uh, I think our first missiles uh, operational were in 1961, if I'm not mistaken, uh, not before 1960 or so. No, we didn't have ICBMs. We have what? We didn't have those numbers. Of no, ICBMs. we were. We were. I'm talking about ours. Right. But uh, the thought was that they had would have hundreds, and by 60 at the latest, 1960 campaign year, that they would have uh, perhaps 300. Uh, General Thomas Power, head of Strategic Air Command, has said in 1960, actually, that they he thought they had uh, uh, 300. And um, Herman Kahn, my colleague at RAND, who wrote a book on thermonuclear war, and who coined the concept doomsday machine as a hypothetical concept, uh, he was estimating about 300 uh, with the notion that that would suffice to uh, prevent our retaliation. Possibly nothing else would come. But a premise of that was, why did we believe that so much? The, all the intelligence agencies, then the Army, Navy, it was before Defense Intelligence Agency, Army, Navy, and Air Force, and the CIA, all shared a premise with my mentors at RAND, Albert Wolfsetter and the others, all anti-communists, as I was, very much, cold warriors, but the premise was that not only in Stalin, but in his successors, we were facing essentially Hitler with nuclear weapons. And very much the premise that just as Hitler had been bent on world domination and first domination of Eurasia, uh, that uh, the, all the communist leaders, the Bolsheviks, uh, you mentioned Bolshevik tonight, but Nathan Leitis, for instance, wrote the operational code of the Politburo of the uh, communists, and the notion that they were totally obsessed with the idea of taking over either by threat, like Hitler in the 30s, or by attack by actual attack. And that's what we were facing. And Taking over the world. What? Taking over the world. Essentially the world. World domination. And, and the next bit in that logic was that what was in their way? Well, the United States was in their way on this. And so uh, even though we weren't threatening them, the idea was, they had to dispose of us. And they would want them out of the way, us out of the way, and then the field would be clear. And that they might, or even would, as Bolsheviks, cold-blooded, calculating communists, this was Nathan Leitis, would be willing to sacrifice very considerable numbers of their own people. Now, let me say right away, I think looking back on it, that was an extreme falsification of the uh, mentality of Russians from top to bottom who had lived through World War II. But the idea was actually Albert Wolf that I used to say, well, they lost 20 million people in World War II, and look at them now. They came through that very well. Now, when I say that, I'm saying when I, when I said anything like that to a Russian leader, they would almost vibrate like a, you know, we were invaded, you know, we suffered this going right, in, the point. Russians coming, the Germans coming in, and then coming out, fighting both ways. You know, the idea of repeating World War II was just uh, Now, what happened terrible. is this entire logic is based upon the idea that they have the capability to do so. But you found some the sand in the And the gears, will, is what right? I'm just saying. So but let's talk about the capability that, and the missile gap and what happened to the missile gap. Well, in 19... Let's talk about the corona and, and the, the corona satellite. Well, I'll tell you, our actual reconnaissance capabilities were known only to a couple people at RAND, a half dozen or so. They didn't know, except for this half dozen who'd been very involved in the development, about the U-2 flying, say, from 56 on, the very high-flying uh, airplane that flew above what the Russian capabilities at that time until 1960 were able to shoot down. Then uh, that was replaced by reconnaissance satellites, uh, which are still operating, of course, very much. And we use the U-2, but not over Russia, but various places. Okay. People at RAND didn't know of the existence, except for this handful, maybe as many as a dozen at the very most, out of 500 professionals, uh, knew of this, that we, that we knew anything uh, about what was going on in the ground in Russia from the photography. In 
61, uh, actually, I was out at Strategic Air Command headquarters in Offutt, uh, Omaha, and spoke to a, a colonel I'd known back in the Pentagon, who was now chief of war plans at SAC. And he said, uh, you know what the old man, Thomas Power, uh, thinks they have? I said, no, what's that? A thousand, a thousand ICBMs. Now, what was dramatic about that was that the CIA and the uh, others were estimating at that time about, and the Air Force, estimating about 160. So this was a lot more. And uh, that was in uh, August of 1961. Well, in September, a uh, new estimate came in based on total overall photography from the reconnaissance satellites. That very few people have. What? That very Which few people no have. One, yeah, almost no one at RAND actually, actually had. And I was told about it. We will, you know, it's in the book, but I won't go into it now in detail. It was kind of a leak. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be told. But I was told about this new estimate and the basis for it, which I was not able to communicate. It was something I was not supposed to know, and the fact that I knew it would expose, it was like a journalist with his sources, you know, would expose the person who told me. And what the Soviets had was four ICBMs, <laughs> not a thousand, and not 160, and not 120, as some other estimates. And actually, the Army and Navy had been estimating for two years that they had only a handful. And the Air Force people that I was talking to regarded them as traitors, that they were so con determined not to give the Air Force a basis for asking for a lot of missiles of our own. They prepared to underestimate you know, what the Soviets had to this extreme degree in putting our country in danger. Uh, it was just an almost inconceivable amount of treason uh, that they talked. They used that word, by the way. But uh, it turned out they were right. Uh, they hadn't seen any. The U-2 had not seen them. The reconnaissance satellites uh, had not seen them. But then there wasn't overall coverage because of cloud cover and other things until September. And then they decided four uh, is what they had. And, well, that was what you asked. You yeah, know, what, and what that means that the Soviet Union, So this is a stunning, yeah. a stunning development for me, actually. Uh, I went back to RAND, and uh, we mostly operated at the secret level in RAND. I mean, on most of the documents we dealt with, there was top secret reports and top secret, but not, not so often. And we took it very seriously, unlike the Pentagon, where top secret was uh, the everyday thing. Everything was top secret. So at RAND, I called for a top secret briefing. And Herman Kahn, my colleague there, had always said, you have to have It's a very charts. funny scene, by the way. What? It's a very funny scene. Well, it's funny in a way. It's but, funny. Uh, I, I was not someone who operated with charts. Herman said, you always have to have a chart. Now it's a power, PowerPoint. what do they call it? Yes. PowerPoint. But then uh, you didn't have PowerPoint then. So charts with bullet, I don't know, marks on the side. Bullet, uh, Equations, complicated stuff. stuff. So, no, very simple on the chart. Yours was that simple. was the point. So I made some very simple charts, and I had to, uh, and we called a top secret briefing, which was unusual at RAN. Had all the department heads and everybody there, and and it, unlike the Pentagon, that meant that everybody in had to be checked in by a guard, take your name off, uh, make sure that they knew who was there and everything like that. Okay, so I said Herman says you should always have a chart, and people knew that when I gave me, I didn't use charts, like tonight, and uh, I said, but tonight I have some charts. So I had a, a flip table here, you know, and um, the first, and I'd, I'd lettered these myself, it was top secret, so top secret at the top, top secret at the bottom. And the first chart was, yes, Virginia, there is a missile gap. <laughs> Second chart, it is currently running 10 to 1. Third chart, in our favor. Because we had about 40 ICBMs to their four. 40 did, was not a large number compared to what, what came later. But it was 10 times more than they had. Now, much more significantly than that, really, uh, we had 2,000 bombers in range of Russia, intermediate and strategic bombers. We had Polaris missiles on submarines, Polaris submarines, uh, sub-launch missiles, cruise missiles, tactical bombers, about 1,000 tactical bombers in range of Russia. In other words, an immense superiority. And no one believed me. I said, well, how would you know that? Well, how would they know that? 
You know, so I couldn't tell them, actually. That was higher than top secret, definitely. And I didn't have the clearance for, at that time. I did later for this, yeah. higher than top secret. So uh, I, did, I did get it later, but they didn't have it on the whole. They just didn't believe it. This, you know, turned everything around. That's ridiculous, you know, et cetera, et cetera. More than that, though, uh, it raised potentially questions that um, were not raised at Rand at all. It took them a long time to come to believe it, actually. They, in a way, never recovered from this because it totally turned around this obsession, you know, with uh, 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 on our head. But once you had come to believe it, and they did in Washington, they didn't have the same problem from these estimates, it questioned the entire axioms of our Cold War. Khrushchev had not tried to have a first strike capability. Yes, he could have. His early missiles were very bulky and unreliable. He's not going to take over Berlin. No, he wasn't. He couldn't have aimed. He wasn't aiming to have a first strike capability, which we'd assumed he was passionately, you know, obsessed with having and could have. And the answer was, he could have, but he didn't. And that really implied should have caused an entire recalculation of who was we were our adversary and what were their aims, what were they after, after all, and what was possible in the way. For example, another axiom then, which, by the way, applies to North Korea right now, is you can't negotiate with these people. Hitler with nukes. It was true. You couldn't negotiate with Hitler usefully. He would violate everything. He would just you know, observe it as long as it was worthwhile for him, which might be months or weeks or whatever. But it was useless. Uh, you couldn't get out of it. The Soviet Union had not built these weapons without an agreement. So the idea that you could have perhaps negotiated to agree with them to keep them down at this low level just simply never occurred to anybody, as far as I know. And there were even reports on it saying it's, it's striking by Ray Gartoff and so on. But it's striking that nobody ever thought of the point that, uh, you know, maybe you could get an agreement with these people. They weren't bent on taking over the world, which they couldn't do with us in, in our way. Well, that was yeah. simply not, that re recalculation was not made. Yes, and, and what follows from this reality are many, many profound things. Uh, but basically, I think the direction that the book goes in all kinds of interesting different ways is when you talk about the psychology of individuals who are trained to believe and think and uh, uh, superintend organizations and the psychology and sociology of organizations and bureaucracies is that they do what they were designed to do. Uh, so you have the Rand Corporation wants to go on doing nuclear strategy, and the generals want to uh, win wars. And we're all part of organizations in our lives, and we see how they fail, and we see how misunderstandings and tra tragic misconceptions arise. These are just human organizations. And the book is full of tragic misconceptions. I mean, it even starts with the reason uh, we uh, decided we had to press ahead with um, designing uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and we had to build this enormous infrastructure was because of the belief that Hitler was working on a <laughs> nuclear true. weapon. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that was like the, it was exactly like the WMDs in Iraq, yeah. and essentially. Uh, uh, the idea was that, in this case, it was, it was more plausible. The, the Germans had, in fact, been the first to discover the fission of uranium or to experience it. They were ahead of us, physically. It was Hitler. It really was Hitler then. And uh, there was reason to fear that we would be facing Hitler with nuclear weapons. And so even people who felt like we were just talking 75 years ago this last month in Chicago under Stag Field, the uh, athletic field in stadiums in the Chicago the University, yes. University yeah. they were putting together the first pile, as it was then called, a reactor a type pile of piles of, it's called a pile because it involved piles of graphite and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to control the fissioning uh, neutrons, the, the uranium that was fitting to keep it from exploding. And um, 
uh, on the night that they first got the reactor, the pile, to get a chain reaction going, not enough to explode. Uh, in fact, they put control rods in fast enough to keep it from going too far. Enrico Fermi uh, and uh, Leo Zillard and a crew of people were working on this, um, and they got uh, the uh, um, indicator showed that uh, neutrons were being emitted and you were getting a, an exponential reaction so that nuclear fission was possible. So the, they toasted, they put the control rods in, they drank Chianti, you were saying that they did this again to uh, celebrate the anniversary. And uh, at last, people had left, and uh, Fermi and Zillard were left in the room, and Zillard said, I believe this day will go down as a black day in history. Because he'd said even earlier, when he first realized with an oscilloscope that neutrons were emitted with the fission of uranium, uh, more than at first, he said, I knew that mankind was in for a lot of grief. Well, actually, the world hasn't blown up since then. But as you saw in there, what I came to realize after Cuba and other was, it's come much closer to it. We've had a lot of very close calls. The Cuban Missile Crisis was only one of those. And uh, a, a, major, a major one, a major one in 1983 that no one knew about over here, including President Reagan until afterwards, where Andropov believed that the US was on the verge for first strike. And yeah, what? Yes, Abel Archer. Well, and we were conducting an exercise, which the KGB there, and, and Andropov, who was then the premier, had been the head of the KGB, he and the current head believed that Abel Archer, which is a big NATO exercise of nuclear weapons, yeah. control, was a cover for an actual first strike. Yeah. And uh, by the way, we're conducting exercises right now in Korea, right. and we know that Kim Jong-un is obsessed with the idea, not of a nuclear first strike necessarily, but of an attack right. on North Korea. We're flying B-1 bombers, which are, uh, uh, were originally nuclear bombers, essentially. Yeah. Uh, now, not so much. We rely on missiles now. But um, in Korea, uh, there's, essentially. There's, we have this, you know, human beings coexisting with the ability to destroy life on Earth raises, you know, very interesting questions when it comes to the fallibility of human beings. There's one scene in the book, uh, there's so many fascinating digressions and asides, where uh, Charles Percy, who later becomes the senator from Illinois, he's uh, basically, uh, I think he was a, a corporation executive then, a Bell and Howell, and he goes to NORAD uh, because they're showing around all these VIPs, and he's sitting in the chair, which they give people the chance to do, you know, to show how wonderful it is to sit in the big chair where they, you know, command the nuclear command and control system. And this is 1960 or so, and it shows up on the screen that there might be a nuclear attack coming from the Soviet Union. No, the, the alarm bells are going off, and the screens are going. They, they rush the civilians into a side room, and alarm bells are going, klaxons and everything. More, a few ICBMs from Russia are coming. More, more, and one funny thing about this was there were more coming than we believed they had at that point. Uh, but it was a extreme. Well, it turned out, I just thought of a connection here, it turned out that our radar signal, BMUs, the Ballistic Missile Early Warning System, had just gone into operation. And uh, that's in fact, uh, they, Bill and Howell had been involved in okay. helping build that along with IBM, not ICBM, but IBM uh, leader was there to see BMUs turned on. And these attacks are coming right away. The radar signals were bouncing off the moon and were coming back. And by the way, they knew the radar signals would reach the moon, but they didn't think they would be reflected to such an extent that they would appear like incoming missiles. And by the way, if we'd been ready, if they didn't detect that soon enough, uh, our bombers would have taken off. We didn't have many missiles at that point, but the bombers would have taken off. Uh, they might have been told to execute. And in those days, once there was, as in the film, Dr. Strangelove, if an execute message went out, there was no stop message. Why don't you tell the story about visiting the control what? officer? Why don't you tell the story about visiting the control officer 
uh, uh, a way out there in the Pacific. Yes. Well, when I became aware that they're in the Pacific, uh, doing research for Admiral in Chief, uh, Commander in Chief Pacific, Admiral Harry Field, on command and control, I was looking in particular at the possibility that uh, there would be a false alarm. With this in mind, in part, that had happened in 19. Yeah. So, uh, but the possibility that people might believe that they were under attack, and I had become aware that President Eisenhower had delegated authority to his field commanders, including Felt in the Pacific, but also Strategic Air Command, SAC in o Omaha, and all the other major field commanders, in case communications were out. Now, commu with Washington. Now, communications were out part of every day in the Pacific. Uh, so these, Felt was on his own, for example, during parts of the Komoi crisis just a year earlier in 1958. Uh, and uh, moreover, he had delegated this, and I found that Felt had delegated it further for the same reason to Seventh Fleet and to people below it, for the same reason, that communications might be out, as was true elsewhere, or... Eisenhower was concerned that he had had a heart attack, he'd had a stroke at that point. In case of presidential incapacitation, you left this out. Uh, you uh, let them have their own authority. To this day, nearly all of oh, in fact, we've been hearing discussion of it in the last month. Uh, does the president have authority? Can anybody stop him, by the way, our present president? Uh, some reason uh, this question has arisen. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, people are worried that uh, does the president have sole authority? Can he do this? By the way, the answer is no. They can't stop him. Nobody, nobody can with authority uh, or constitutional or legal. He can't be stopped if he says to go. Yes, they may hesitate, and uh, under the circumstances, they may say not now, or we, we don't think it's a good idea. But if he insists, there's no question. It will be done. It can be done. That is the case now. But what people haven't asked, and what don't. How many other people can launch? And the president is being said over and over in the last two weeks, I've seen, has sole authority with the implication that he has the sole ability to launch. As if, for example, there was a code, a, a combination for locks that only the president has. Now, there are locks on the weapons at a low level. But the combination is not held in the White House, and it's not held in the Pentagon. Right. Uh, it's way below that, and uh, more widespread. What about After all, if, one, if, if there were such a code, which you know, I think people, when they talk about the codes in the briefcase that he can do, these are codes that identify him as a president. I'm the president, and whether you like it or not, <laughs> I got uh, the majority of the votes, and I got all, you know, I'm the president, and um, it identifies him as that. But the president is not the only one who can give those orders by when, any means. When you're, um, if he if he was, I just have to. If yeah. he was, a single bomb on Washington could paralyze our force. That has never been the case. It couldn't be the case. And it's not the case for other nuclear powers either, including a nuclear weapon state like North Korea, almost certainly. Almost certainly, I would say, just from the imitation, of, you know, the reasoning in Russia and elsewhere, Kim Jong-un, I feel pretty sure, no more than Russia or the U.S., has allowed the possibility that he could be assassinated and Russia's and North Korea's nuclear weapons, which they have, would be paralyzed. Almost surely he's made provision, like everybody else, that if he's assassinated or there's an attack that takes out the central command and control, there will be nuclear retaliation. I haven't seen that mentioned in uh, any of the current discussions. Well, we, we mentioned it in Esquire this month. Well, our, <laughs> <laughs> if I may say, I said that to you. That's right. <laughs> and uh, you, pr you printed it. Did I that did, get any, yes. anybody pay attention to that? Uh, did anyone read our interview in Esquire? <laughs> Well, now, now the world knows. Uh, well, there's so many, there, there's, there's really, I mean, there's so many directions we can go. There, there are so many unbelievably fascinating byways, the absolute contempt uh, some of these military officers appear to have for um, not just uh, individual life, but millions of individual lives. 
I think where I want to take the discussion, we've done the dead hand device and the, the idea that if, if we uh, have an assassination team take out Kim Jong-un, that might uh, lead to a nuclear exchange. Um, let's go back to the pre-atomic uh, era. Uh, we had some interesting discussions about um, what it's like writing a long, detailed book, as both of us have done, and dealing with editors, as both of us have done, and how hard you fought to keep a section of the book that discusses the idea of strategic bombing and why it is in the first place that the idea that you could win a war by killing thousands and thousands of people uh, through bombing from above evolved and uh, what it means. Well, I didn't have to fight my editor on this issue, <laughs> fortunately, but I would have uh, had it been necessary because although it seems like history, you know, prehistory, as you say, of the like nuclear era, uh, I've felt for over half a century from studies at RAND and elsewhere that you couldn't really understand how we could have come to build this doomsday machine. We couldn't understand the nuclear era and the risks we've been taking, the willingness to kill people unless you knew the history of our strategic bombing program in World War II and how that, for operational reasons, had evolved from an American theory of bombing, which was precise bombing uh, of uh, military bases, individual factories, parts of individual, that was their idea at high site. level. There's a new kind of site that we can use that we yeah, can the, uh, bomb with newfound precision. That's the, always the promise. The uh, secret site that we could, uh, we could do this very precisely and found that in those days and until really quite recently, in fact, the new drones, you know, yeah. have sort of in the last few years achieved the kind of thing that the Air Force thought they had at the beginning of World War II. But the still kind of not precision. perfect, to be fair. No, by it's still any means. collateral damage. It, it's still the case that there's a lot of collateral damage and that you don't know who to aim at. You can hit what you aim at, right. but, you know, who should be? But that's... That's the current situation. Back then, it took them a while to realize that when they were flying with this high, uh, high altitude daylight bombing against anti-aircraft, fire and so forth, and the heavy winds cutting them, so very, took great courage and many, many uh, crews were, were killed in the course of this. They weren't hitting what they were aiming at. They weren't, really there was nothing much you could hit except whole sections of cities. You couldn't hit a, a corner of a factory as they thought they could when they were flying in Arizona in clear weather with no winds and you know and no anti-aircraft and so forth. You didn't you, you didn't have that kind of accuracy at all, and you were you were dying. You were losing your crew during the day without hitting. You had to do it during the day when there was light. During the day, yeah. So more and more, we did what the British had done for the same reasons early on, which was to fly at night or in clouds using radar, which was not precise at all pretty much the same as what the British were doing flying. And using incendiaries, uh, basically, uh, what the British had started in 42, which was aiming at the built-up areas, mostly workers' housing, not because they were workers, but because their houses were closer together. And then fire would spread better. Or if you dropped a high-explosive bomb, it would hit something down there, whatever, uh, people. So, uh, and at first, our, our Air Force called the British baby killers, civilian killers. This was war crime, this was terrible, uh, every, every principle. We came more and more to do that, to aim. And in Japan, when we discovered with the jet stream, uh, so-called the air, air winds, it just made it impossible to hit anything very accurately, uh, they decided to adopt fully the ability to cause a firestorm as demonstrated in Hamburg and Dresden by the British, which is, uh, I could get into, but which is a widespread fire that uh, simultaneously, not just sequentially, but all at the same time by dropping a lot of incendiaries in a big pattern, so that a column of air would rise very uh, fast, creating low pressure in that area, bringing in winds from all around, changing the wind patterns, basically like a bellows in a fireplace or a furnace. 
and the temperatures would now rise to extremely high temperatures, 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. People uh, being asphyxiated with the loss of oxygen in the shelters, or as Kurt Vonnegut put it when he, in Dresden when he came out of Slaughterhouse-Five, people's bodies shrunk in the shelters like gingerbread people, basically. But in Tokyo, for example, well, in Dresden and in Hamburg, in Tokyo, where this was put to great effect, on the, March of, uh, the night of March 9th and 10th, 1945, and how many people here, and what I'm, I'm sure is a relatively well-informed audience, and, and uh, not school kids here, how many know what I'm talking about, the night of March 9th and 10th? Well, that's more than often. How many do not, actually, honestly? Okay. Uh, they caused a firestorm. Oh, as I say, this uh, wind would come up, enormous temperatures. The asphalt on the streets would be melting and burning so that people who came out of the shelters would be caught in the asphalt and would burn like torches. And it's the enormous winds that were uh, caused, hurricane winds, basically, that are caused by this firestorm. Um, pardon me, I'm sorry to tell these details, but I put it in the book because I felt... Uh, it, ha it had to be understood by people. Many people reported babies being snatched out of the arms of mothers into this inferno of fire by the winds. Tokyo was crisscrossed with canals. So people who got out of the asphalt and uh, out of the shelters ran toward, with their families, in sense, into the canals to escape from the fire but the canals were boiling, and tens of thousands boiled to death in the canal. The uh, winds, these updrafts, were bouncing the aircraft, almost flipping them over in some cases, B-52s, enormous updrafts that would send them over, but at low altitude, thousands of feet still above the city, the aircraft, the, the crews had to put on their oxygen masks, even though they were low, to escape the stench of burning flesh, which was making them sick and throwing up. So uh, as LeMay, who was in charge of that, Curtis LeMay, later head of the Strategic Air Command, uh, tells it in his book, uh, Mission with LeMay, uh, he said, it was the greatest man-made uh, killing, the death, in the history of the world, he said, and he, he boasts about this, frankly, he says, greater than the London fire, greater than the San Francisco earthquake, greater than the Tokyo firestorm caused by uh, an earthquake which um, overturned a lot of fuel all over the place. He said, greater than all this, 80 to 120,000 people were killed in one night, burned, at least 80,000, maybe 120,000. Now. That's more than Hiroshima five months later or Nagasaki put together in one night for their immediate casualties. He then, with this success, turned to doing the same to the next 67 cities in Japan, more or less in order of population. Fires, whenever, never got another firestorm. The weather had to be just right for incendiaries to get this firestorm as it had been in Hamburg and Dresden. Only the three major firestorms. They were always trying. They tried, for example, as they've said over, almost on every raid to cause a firestorm in Berlin. They could never do it. Too much masonry, the houses weren't close enough together. On one night, they killed 25,000 people in the spring of 45. But they couldn't get you know, this whole firestorm. And the military until, Hirosh rationale. until Hiroshima. A nuclear weapon gives you a firestorm nearly every time. And a uh, uh, big difference here. So, you know, they were, that was very good uh, from the LeMay's point of view when he became head of the Strategic Air Command. By, uh, by 1950, and between 50 and 52, we had about 1,000 Hiroshima and Nagasaki weapons, which are now several times larger in yield than uh, Nagasaki, which was 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent. Now, that's a thousand times more than the yield, the explosive yield, of the largest blockbuster of World War II. Okay, so uh, 20,000 20, tons instead of 20 tons or 10 tons. And uh, we had a thousand of those. 
which would have burned, this is under Truman now, targeted all on Russian USSR cities, essentially. It wasn't until 1983, that's 20 years after I was working on the war plans, that scientists discovered, including Carl Sagan and Brian Toon and uh, Turco and uh, a few, uh, actually seven or eight people put a thing together saying, the firestorms would cause the smoke to be smoke and soot from the burning cities to be lofted into the stratosphere, as must have happened in Tokyo and Hamburg. That was just one city at a time. But if you have a hundred, several hundred cities burning at the same time with firestorms, the smoke lofted into the stratosphere will not burn, will not rain out. Uh, it will go around the globe fast in the stratosphere within days and absorb 70% of the sunlight. At first, in 1983, they thought would, that would be for about a year. That was, uh, a year was all their computer programs could, could go to, the power they had then. But that would be enough to starve nearly everyone on Earth. And uh, Sagan at that time said uh, extinction was possible, even likely. But it's turned out now in the last 10 years, then other people cast doubt on this. The same people, by the way, who doubt climate change. Handful of people compared to other scientists. But they said, no, it's not nuclear matter, it's just nuclear autumn, it won't be that bad, and so forth. And there were real uncertainties about it then. The uncertainties have been dispelled in the last 10 years. 83 was you know, 35 years ago. In the last 10 years, there have been studies that show now with computers that are far more powerful and climate change uh, models that are very much more accurate, very scientific consensus now, the smoke stays up there for 10 years or more, which they couldn't even compute before. The harvests go in the first months, in the first year. We have a food supply on Earth of 60 days for the world population, but a lot of it is in the U.S. and some places. So ours would last longer. We'd stop exporting, and we, we would last most of the year, possibly, maybe two years. But not everybody's extinction is very unlikely. Near extinction is almost certain. 98 percent, 97, 99 percent of the people will starve to death from our own first strike or the Russians' first strike, as a matter of fact. Uh, there's no difference between striking first and striking second. Everybody goes. The idea of launching on warning is absolutely, makes no difference whether you go, as I say, first or second. And that's what I, I think we were talking earlier with the title of the book, uh, the Doomsday Machine. Herman Kahn conceived of this idea of a doomsday machine as a hypothetical construct, a very good deterrent, kill everybody, that was the idea. And you could do it, he thought of it doing with radioactivity primarily, like on the beach, you know, cobalt bombs that eventually kill everybody. That can be done. The idea, I would say, looking at it as a deterrent, uh, you know, why you would think of doing all that, killing everybody? Well, it would be relatively very cheap. You could put it in your own country. You could put it in the ocean. You could put it anywhere. We could, it just, or now with smoke, we know, we could bomb our own city. We could just blow them up. You don't, you don't have to truck the warheads over, fly them over to another country. You have them wherever, and they, they go off, and it's very cheap. Relatively. But Herman said, uh, but, you know, it, it obviously kills too many people. Uh, everybody, in fact. Uh, and uh, John Somerville coined the term omnicide for this, omnicide. Not genocide, it's multigenocide, it's not multigen, it's, it's killing nearly everybody. Well, as I've said, with smoke, you don't kill everybody, but close enough to it. Herman said, there is no doomsday machine, this was in 59 and 60, and I don't believe anyone will ever build one. And uh, uh, he was wrong. We had it then, uh, in 59 and 56, uh, 60, and in 58 when I was looking at this. The Russians did not have it then. They didn't have it till after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when they had to back down, and Khrushchev is forced out 
by Brezhnev, who tells the generals, you support me, and you can have whatever you want. And what they wanted was what they asked Khrushchev for, and he had refused it. We want what the Americans have. And what the Americans... So they, they built a doomsday machine. But I've gone on about this because, uh, on the question of the title, before 1983, really nobody knew that a doomsday machine did exist and had existed for some years. And we have retained it ever since. And we're about to spend $1.2 trillion on both sides, essentially, over the next 30 years, to rebuild it, to buy new models of everything, ICBMs, sub-launch missiles, cruise missiles, bombers, to rebuild uh, the capability to what we now know is destroying nearly all humans, not all life. Most biomass will survive. That's microbes, microorganisms, bacteria will survive. Dad, do you, uh, do you see a path out? What? Do you see a path out? Yes. Uh, actually, it would be easy to dismantle the doomsday machines in principle and, in, uh, and in, uh, physically. It wouldn't take very long uh, because nobody ever intended deliberately to have a doomsday machine. They just acquired one without realizing what they had there exactly. <laughs> Nobody would build one now, I think, to start with, but to rebuild it, you know, to resume it. There's just, okay, you could, to start with, get rid of the ICBMs on our side, for example, which are lightning rods for attack, and which General Cartwright, who was head of strategic command, has for years now been saying, get rid of the ICBMs. General Lee Butler, first commander of the, uh, the um, missile of the strategic command, uh, said that, you know, get rid they've been anachronistic since we had sub-launched missiles, which are invulnerable. And they have sub-launched missiles, which we can't target right. so on no either accidents. side. And those are more than enough to cause not just 20 million like the Russians in World War II, you know, but a much higher number. If you want deterrence, you don't need 1,500 warheads on alert, the way both sides have now, far more than will cause nuclear winter. You do not need a capability for that. You have actually no military rationale for it. But there are jobs involved in maintaining those missiles. There is an ICBM caucus, cable uh, caucus, in Washington, in, in Congress, which consists of 10 senators, six from the three states that house Minuteman missiles, ICBMs, one from Nevada where they're refurbished, where they're maintained, and one in Louisiana where strategic bombers are based. And by coincidence, these are the 10 senators who say, we have to have these missiles. Nobody else could make a case for this. What, they want them on hot alert, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every year, not cold alert, not why? More restaurants, more jobs, more uh, real estate deal, whatnot. It doesn't seem like you know strong reasons, but you know it's a reason. And building these, what's the 1.2 billion uh, involved in? Building them involves profits. And by the way, Russia has profits now. Uh, they used to have bureaucratic reasons for wanting what the U.S. had. Now they've got that. And the same reasons we do. They have profits. It's capitalist. And oligarchy. OK. So um, both these are overpowering. Hardly any Americans realize what it is they're talking about rebuilding. See, it's something to deter attack. Uh, Herb York, that I knew, who was the first head of Livermore Laboratory, uh, design laboratory, which was a rival to Los Alamos, concentrate on the h -bomb. He later said to Livermore at a talk in the 80s, I actually it was uh, by coincidence, it was about 82 or 83. He said when nuclear winter was discovered, but he didn't have that uh, in his talk. And he said, how many weapons does it actually take to deter nuclear attack? And he said, well, one or 10, you know, if you want to have extra and make sure some survive. He says, and then he went at it from another point of view. He said, 
How many deaths should a single human leader be able to inflict as a capability? He said, well, suppose we take, just speculatively here, the number of deaths in World War II, about 60 million. And you could do that now with nuclear weapons in one day. He said, okay, let's say 60 million. How many would that take? A hundred. He says, it might take a hundred. You could say 200, but it's closer to a hundred. He said, so let's say then, let's talk about a limit for deterring nuclear attack of one to 10 to a hundred. But he said, I believe it would be closer to one than it is to a hundred. In 1952, we had a thousand fission warheads. Eisenhower came in, and when he left office eight years later, we had 23,000 weapons, most of them thermonuclear weapons, many of them a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima weapons. 23,000. At the height in the 60s for the US, and that was under Johnson, 37,000 nuclear weapons. And the Russians didn't have as many then, but they came to have about another uh, 34, 35,000 weapons. Together, 70,000 weapons in the world. Now, <laughs> what do you say you know, uh, about this? And what would the effects be? In 1961, I'm going on here, but you, you were asking me earlier about the book. A question I drafted that was sent to the Joint Chiefs of Staff by President Kennedy, under President Kennedy's name, was this question. If your plans, which were first strike plans, essentially, in case of Berlin, we would go first, how many people would die in the Soviet Union from our attack? And I go into this in more detail, but the bottom line is the questions came back very fast. No apology, no uh, embarrassment, no nothing. They were, here's the answer. 600 million. 350, 325 million to be exact in their figuring in the USSR and China alone. But another 325 million. Another 100 million in East Europe, the satellite nations. Another 100 million in West Europe, those are our allies, from fallout, <coughs> radioactive fallout from our strikes in East Europe and the USSR, depending on the wind, with no warheads of ours falling there at all. Another 100 million in areas contiguous to the USSR and China, neutrals like Austria, Finland, uh, Afghanistan, actually. Uh, it's, uh, from the fallout, not from warheads falling on them. Japan, uh, India, so forth. A total then of 600 million, or 100 holocausts. And I looked at that and I thought, this machine, this system that we have, should not exist. This piece of paper that I'm holding in my hand, which is an estimate of what would happen, not hypothetically, but as in the Joint Chiefs estimate of what the consequences would be of their carrying out their operational plan this year in the Berlin crisis that year, the next year in Cuba. It's the most evil and insane plan and put together by people that I knew were, were not insane, they were not monsters, they were ordinary, intelligent Americans, the colonels that I dealt with on the staff, and they had created this. Well, as I said earlier, uh, that I think could not have come about without the experience in World War II where General LeMay, who became head of the Strategic Air Command, had commanded uh, the, the killing, deliberately, of 100,000 people in one night, as much as you could have done. It was the, the largest act of terror of civilians, deliberate killing of civilians in our history. In, I mean, human history, not in American history. And the, his successor, as head of strategic command, was Palmer, Thomas Power, who had led the raid and observed the raid. 
over Tokyo. Uh, LeMay was not allowed to lead the maid as he wanted to, the raid. He was a very brave man physically. He had led raids in Germany constantly uh, through anti-aircraft fire, but they wouldn't let him go because he knew of what he called the firecracker that was coming in some months, the atom bomb. It might have been captured and given that. So he wasn't allowed to, to send... But they sent Power, who, by the way, I never thought of this implication, but that must mean he had not told Power, or that his, right. which would have kept Power from going. And the others, he was, he was the one who knew that at that point. So these people come in, and LeMay had learned that as he told my friend at Rand, Sam Cohen, at one point, who was known as the father of the neutron bomb, by the way, he liked that uh, phrase, he said, Sam... War is killing people. And he meant civilians, by the way. As he later said, there are no innocent civilians. There are no civilians in wartime. You know, it's mobilized. They're the enemy. Uh, you know, they all contribute to the war effort. There are no innocent civilians, said Lemay. But anyway, war is killing people. And the way you win the war is you kill enough until the other guy quits. And so when we put atom bombs in his hand. More and more were necessary when they became H-bombs, thermonuclear weapons. Then the number expected to be killed rose from a run of 10 or 15 million in a day by atom bombs to several hundred million in a day with H-bombs. They just put them in secretly. Hardly anybody looked at these plans. Here was the unthinking part of it. You just have a bigger bomb here, put it in, same target, uh, which were cities, essentially. And so we had this plan in which in a first strike over Berlin, or possibly Iran, which was a consideration at that time, or Yugoslavia, if they wanted to recapture Yugoslavia, and if we were fighting Soviet troops, then the Eisenhower plan was to hit every city in Russia, I should say the USSR, the Soviet bloc, and China. Because the concept was a Sino-Soviet bloc, although, as we were saying earlier, already by 60, 59, 60, 61, the intelligence people knew that there was a growing split between the Soviet Union and China. But anyway, you were going to you were going to hit everything, every city, uh, simultaneously. Do you have uh, energy for a few questions? See? Do you have energy for some questions? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> he has energy. 86 years old. Uh, sure. Dan Ellsberg. Uh, we'll take a few questions. Well, so we're going to ask if you do have a couple of questions that you come up along this side and speak into the microphone. Thanks. Ben, do you have any jokes? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know if, uh, uh, well, he didn't say that no one was going to get their hair mussed. <laughs> yes, My hair was bad. He asked so if there were, you had any jokes. Well, yes. <laughs> you, you, mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the title here uh, earlier. How we were talking about how I came to the title. So I wasn't going to repeat it again because my editor is here, but she's from Bloomsbury. And when my son revealed to me that Bloomsbury, very good, the British part of it, which is their main base, uh, published Harry Potter. <laughs> and uh, that sounded very good. And I said, well, that gives me my title. Harry Potter and the Doomsday Machine. <laughs> and I said, uh, by J.K. Rowling. Uh, I'm, I'm modest. I don't, I, even, I don't even have to have my name on the cover. And uh, they informed me their legal department uh, frowned on that. If, 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 if all of you can get uh, all your friends to buy a copy, then maybe we'll have the impact that J.K. Rowling has had and we'll uh, help end the madness. So who would like to ask a question? Uh, please wait for the microphone. Why now? Why didn't you write this book 20 years ago? I, I have a, a lot of theories on that, but I'd like to hear what, why now? Actually, uh, he, uh, Rick mentioned earlier that when I started copying the Pentagon Papers in 1969 uh, with the example of draft resistors very much in my mind, I had just met some who were on their way to prison, and it made me think, what can I do to help shorten this war in Vietnam now that I'm ready to go to prison like these people. And so I thought of putting out something, uh, the Pentagon Papers, and I started, uh, that was 40, 
seven volumes of top secret documents, 7,000 pages on decision making in Vietnam. And then when I started on that, I realized, well, now that I'm going to prison for that, uh, something that's more important, actually, is this nuclear material that I've been working on for years. The notes. So I, I copied everything in my top secret safe and a lot of stuff from the secret safes. I was one of the few people who had a top secret safe in my own office. Uh, actually, most people had to go to the top secret office and sign in for it and so forth. So I copied all that with the intention of putting it out after my trials uh, on the Vietnam case. And, and when the sort of Pentagon Papers had had their attempt to you know, awaken people to the problems of Vietnam, I would then put out the nuclear. And actually a friend of mine who was going to prison, Randy Keeler, when I told him this on his way to prison that he had inspired me and I wanted him to know that he'd had an effect on my life. And he said, don't bother with the uh, Vietnam. We know enough about Vietnam. Uh, stuff is out there and so forth. Uh, he said, do the nuclear right now. And I said, well, I agree with you. The nuclear is more important. But Vietnam is where the bombs, just high explosive bombs and incendiaries, are falling now. So I want to try to shorten that. And then I'll do the nuclear. And he didn't mention what happened to all that, but it's in the book here for the first time, actually. I, it was a big secret. Uh, yeah, you gotta, my, we got to leave something for the book. And uh, <clears throat> the story of um, what happened to those papers is astonishing. Well, but I won't go. I won't go through it. But I'll no, just no, to give no. you the bottom line here, uh, the uh, they were being separately uh, stored, buried in a trash heap, actually near Terrytown, in <laughs> uh, by my brother, and a hurricane, a hurricane, uh, hurricane but, Harvey scattered this all about, and I, I couldn't recover it. And now I'll, I'll tell you something else was the basis in direct answer to your question. As soon as the war was over, I'd found to my anguish ever since that I'd lost all those documents. You know, I had some notes. I had a lot of notes, actually, left. But the, what I'd meant to put out had pretty much gone. But uh, I guess I do. I'm not sure I say this in the book. But no. not because it was a secret. I just didn't get around to it. Uh, my lawyer... Charlie Nesson of Harvard Law School, when, my, when I began my trial, which ultimately was facing 115 years for the Pentagon Papers, and he said, you know, my, uh, Leonard Boudin, uh, my main lawyer, and he know very little about the government secrecy system. Tell us the, what you knew about the secrecy system, you know, and so forth. So for, for more than five days, all day, I dictated. Uh, I mean, he transcribed at that point, And about 500 pages of transcript of what I've been telling you, you know, about uh, this sort of thing, the Cuban Missile Crisis and other things. And so I had that, that long transcript for, for them. Charlie did not know that I had copied, you know, and lost all those documents. Only my lawyer, my main lawyer, Leonard Boudin, knew that. My wife didn't know that. I didn't want her implicated you know, in all of it. But I did have that. And actually, uh, one last thing, when the war ended, I took a large part of that 500 pages, edited a little bit from a transcript, and showed it to a top editor in New York, one of the main editors. And she said, very interesting, but we'd sell 1,400 copies of this. <laughs> this is in the 75. So the nuclear war was not at the top of people's minds at that point. So I said, well, that's all right. That's a member of, one for every member of Congress. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, of others, media people. and so. She said, no, you don't understand. That means we don't publish it. And so I gave up on on uh, a book, because if she said that, uh, I think her head had been turned a little bit, this would partly identify her, but she had just published two million copy hardback sellers, uh, Blind Ambition and another, The President's Man and all. So 1,400, 1400 didn't, uh, didn't uh, grab her. Anymore. But like to, to, to take it up to, yeah, you so had I, trouble I said, finding I thought, a... Well, I'll, I'll spend my time, and I spent really most of the next 40 years uh, well, all of the next morning, trying to build, help to build an anti-nuclear movement like the one that helped end the Vietnam War. 
and with some success. The bilateral nuclear weapons freeze movement later I was very in on the beginning. As a matter of fact, one of the co-founders of that was Randy Keeler, now out of prison, the man who told me to go with the nuclear rather than uh, the uh, Vietnam. You had, um, it wasn't, once you decided to write this book, you didn't have an easy time finding a publisher. Uh, well, Harry Potter was turned down by 12 publishers. <laughs> uh, and so I take that as a very good sign. This was actually, so, um, this gonna, was actually gonna, turned down by more than that before, for yeah. commercial reasons. Before Bloomsbury spotted it, and once again, uh, they the, had a winner. I trust their judgment. What's, what's Nancy's last name? What? What's Nancy's last name? Miller. Yeah. You want to know who, uh, the, who Nancy the, Miller, uh, Dan, oh, Nancy editor, is here yeah. from Bloomsbury. So let's give her and Dan a round of applause for giving us this gift. I want, to, I want to thank Rick, and I want to thank Mr. Ellsberg for being here tonight. This was an amazing opportunity for everybody, and the American Writers Museum was thrilled to be able to host this event. And as I mentioned earlier, if you are interested in getting a copy of the Doomsday Machine, they are on sale in the Meyer Gallery, which you can go to the back and turn to the left, and Mr. Ellsberg will be up front signing books. Thank you all for coming tonight. You're not done yet. Thank you. Very good. Let me go there again. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs>